So welcome, my name is Tim McPherson and this is another one of our webinars that Saltwater Boat Angling does in association with Navionics. Uh, and today we're going to talk about bluefin tuna, which is a very exciting subject and one that is on the tips of many tongues in the southwest at the moment as uh, uh, anglers and fishermen and other people see uh, many of these fish busting out of the sea at this time of year. Uh, and here with me to talk about it is uh, Steve Murphy. He's a keen saltwater sports fisherman and he's fished all over the world, particularly for tuna. He's a member of the Angling Trust. He's the conservation officer for the Sport Fishing Club of the British Isles. And he's also the founder of Bluefin Tuna UK, uh, which is a campaign to try and make sure that uh, the UK gets a quota for bluefin tuna so that we can recreationally fish for them. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. So, um, Steve, uh, now, as I said just now, we're seeing reports of Atlantic bluefin tuna uh, this summer uh, and during this part of the autumn too in the southwest and actually a bit further up the channel too, I think, and in the Irish Sea. How, how widespread do you think this presence of fish is? Um, and uh, more importantly, why are they coming back every year? Yeah, sure, Tim. Well, <clears throat> as you say, it's, it's very widespread. I mean, these are not isolated pockets of fish. Um, we're seeing them all across the UK's western waters, um, across Irish, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish waters. And they really sort of reappeared um, around about 2013, 2015. And uh, these patterns are sort of seasonal migration. So you know, these fish spawn in, uh, in the warmer seas in the, whether it's the Gulf of Mexico and the West Atlantic and some other spawning sites there or the Mediterranean. And then after the spawning um, period in sort of May, June, July, they head north in the autumn to, uh, to fatten up again. So there's always been a sort of a, a natural northern progression into the far northeast Atlantic. But really, um, you know, the, the last four, five, six years, the scale and the extent of that has been quite dramatic. Now, what, why it is, well, I suppose we don't really know 100% well, you know, for sure why, um, but it's likely to be a combination of factors. So the first really is that the North Atlantic is, um, is subject to a series of sort of long-term climatic cycles that last around 30 to 40 years. Um, and these change not just water temperatures in certain locales, but the entire current structure uh, changes. And this creates different habitats. And so it affects obviously you know, everything from you know, phytoplankton through to small fry to the, the fish that you know, prey on those and the fish that prey on those and so on and so forth. So you look at things like mackerel stocks, for example, people say, well, there's no mackerel you know, anymore. Well, there's, there's, there's less mackerel in the southern waters in the UK, but there's certainly no shortage of mackerel overall. They've just moved further north. Oh, right. Okay. On the other side of the coin, you know, we're seeing a lot more of um, Mediterranean type fish species in the southwest, as well as things like anchovies. We've seen unprecedented number of anchovies in the southwest of the UK. So these cycles, people tend to talk of them as being you know, warm and cool phases. It is more complicated than that, but it's quite a nice description. So the, the last sort of big warm phase that we had was 1925 to 1963. And some of you, your viewers will recall, that's really the heyday, includes the heyday of the, um, of the Tunny Club and the whole bluefin tuna sport fishing operation uh, that operated in the North Sea, you know, out of Whitby and Scarborough and so on. It's one of those things in people's memories, isn't it? Catching, catching North Sea tuna. Yeah, absolutely. And these guys were there in their tweeds with this like 1930s fishing tackle and it attracted, you know, movie stars and you know, the rich and famous because it really was one of the biggest sport fishing destinations on the planet, really the early to mid thirties. And then after the war and the early 1950s, um, that fishery really disappeared in the mid fifties. And we think that was as much down to the depletion of the herring stocks at that time um, as it was to the climatic conditions right. because the, the Norwegian commercial fishery carried on really until 1963 across the, 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 uh, the, North, of that, uh, the North Sea. Um, and then 1963, bang, that all stopped. The fish practically disappeared in the far North Sea, the Atlantic, um, you know, from that point onwards. So people, you had a cool phase then. Sorry, Tim. So I was going to say, people often think that it was that overfishing that, that, that um, you know, was the demise of particularly the, the sort of North Sea tuna fishing. Uh, um, experience clearly. What you're saying is it's actually the the the, the feedstock that they were they were living on that was that was driving them out. Is that correct? 
So I, I've no doubt that some of the numbers of fish that were taken didn't help, but I think the evidence seems to suggest that really it's these longer term habitat um, environment conditions um, and the availability of prey that are the biggest factors. Of course, you can overfish, and we'll touch on this shortly, you can overfish a species <laughs> and, and affect its distribution. Well, uh, sure. so, so we had this, this, this cold cool phase from 63 to, to around about 2000. We have no fish present really in the far north sea Atlantic in these seasonal migrations. And then about 2000, we entered you know, a, um, a warm phase. The fish, I mentioned earlier on that these fish really began to appear back in our waters and Ireland and so on, around about 2013 to yeah, 2015. I was going to say, there's no knowledge of, well, as far as I know, of people seeing or catching them accidentally in the early part of the century. So that's quite an interesting point. So why is that? Yeah, well, that brings me to my second point, really, in terms of, you know, why are they here? And I think you have to bear in mind that that, that early 2000s was really the period where Atlantic bluefin tuna stocks absolutely nosedived. They were on their knees. I mean, they had decades of commercial overfishing and uh, Atlantic bluefin was on a path to extinction. So I think you had, well, you had that habitat environment was, you know, was improving for these fish. The numbers were being so devastated, particularly those mature fish, which are the ones that have the greater tolerance and tend to come further north, that I think it's just that there wasn't as many fish around at that particular point in time. And what's happened since 2007, uh, ICAP, the governing body, put a recovery plan in place um, for the East Atlantic Mediterranean stock, which is important to note that this stock comprises around 90% of the total, uh, less than 10% is the Western Atlantic, the American stock, if you like. And that recovery plan um, began to bear fruit um, and numbers have begun to recover since about 2010. So I think you've got this combination of the habitat uh, has, has, has changed, that environment has changed. Mm -hmm. And in the last 10 years, you've had a recovery in numbers. And I think perhaps um, that sort of greater competition for food, uh, those kind of issues are driving the fish further north as well. So we're, um, there's a lot of research going on into this right now, but we don't know 100%, but you know, it's not as simple as global warming. It may well be that you know, global warming is exacerbating these conditions and is making uh, the habitat even more favorable in the autumnal months. But um, I don't think it's, it's clearly not the single, single factor for sure. Yeah, I mean, you, you were talking about the, 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 the water temperature and just, just earlier on, um, uh, you know, about the changes in that. Most people think that bluefin tuna are a sort of tropical fish, don't they? Uh, they don't associate them with, with our waters. So um, how, how, I mean, is, is that just a misnomer? Um, well, not all tuna are, are created equal. Um, there's one particular branch of the tuna family um, that have adapted to allow them to really tolerate a much wider uh, range of, uh, of temperatures. So the uh, subgenus Tunnus, which includes albacore, big eye, and the three bluefin species, southern uh, bluefin, Pacific bluefin, and Atlantic bluefin. They're the most adapted of the bunch, and Atlantic bluefin in, in particular. And they're, um, uh, they're endothermic, which basically means they have the ability to sort of maintain their body temperature um, at a higher level than the surrounding water. And in fact, they don't just maintain it, they, also, they can regulate that temperature as well within a particular range. So for Atlantic bluefin, that means they can actually uh, tolerate water temperatures as warm as uh, the low 30s and as cold as you know, down to six or eight degrees. They have this uh, heat regulation system. The, the, the blood that's coming from their heart is cold. Um, and the blood that's coming back through the veins that's been around their muscles is warm. And they have this interchange, which allows like a pre-warming of that cold blood and obviously muscles operate better at higher temperatures. Um, they have these huge gills and can extract, they extract more oxygen from the water than we extract from the air. And that enables them to do these huge great migrations, tolerate you know, wide ranges in water temperatures. They can dive to a, you know, a thousand meters in, in, in search of prey and then bask back on the, you know, on the surface and so on. So um, they're really pretty, pretty amazing, pretty special fish, but they're certainly, when it comes to Atlantic bluefin, you shouldn't think of them as a tropical water fish. So there are um, reports, of course, uh, about bluefin tuna being endangered. Um, everyone seems to think that, and, and that's not just bluefins, I guess, it's all, uh, all species of tuna have been under a lot of pressure, haven't they? Um, so this is kind of at odds with your comments about the fact that we've got a recovery, in, in certainly in the eastern Atlantic, where we are, 
Um, so what's happening to the stock then? Uh, and, and who's actually managing that stock? Because obviously somebody must be doing that. Yeah, sure. So in terms of the, the management issue, so um, obviously Bluefin, you know, their, their habitat and their migrations uh, cut across in numerous jurisdictions. And if you didn't have a joined up management process, everyone would be doing their own thing mm -hmm. and the stock will be fished to extinction <laughs> within a decade. So this was recognized um, after the war. In the 1960s, uh, a group got together and formed a, a global uh, management organization for the species, which is the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tuna, bit of a mouthful, ICAT. We talk a lot about ICAT. Yeah. Um, and currently there's around, I think, 75 nations, if you include the EU individually, it's around 75 nations signed up to it. Um, and they, they agree sort of quotas, the science work is all funded between them, uh, quotas are allocated between them, etc. From the mid 90s until around 2007, um, you know, the, 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 the total allowable catch, the quota, if you like, for Atlantic bluefin all across the North Atlantic was around 30 odd thousand tons. We now know, having gone back and there's data mined, you know, how many ships were at sea, how many fish were being sold in, you know, in markets in Tokyo and so on, that in fact, each year, they were taking between 50 and 60,000 tonnes wow. as opposed to a 30,000 tonne quota. So, you know, with that and the growth of um, tuna farms, which were incredibly damaging in their early days, it's not surprising that stocks absolutely were collapsing. Um, and by the early noughties, I mean, another 10 years, you would have been looking at effective extinction for the species. Fortunately, um, ICAT finally got their act together. Um, in 2007, uh, they implemented a 15-year recovery plan um, for that Eastern Atlantic Mediterranean stock, that 90% of the total yeah. stock. They slashed quotas, they increased the monitoring and enforcement, and they put controls on tuna farms. What effectively happened was you went from 50 to 60,000 tonnes per year being caught uh, over the quota to a point where the quotas were cut to about 13,000 tonnes, oh. and they were probably catching not far off of 13 to 15,000 tonnes. So it was a massive reduction you know, in quotas. When, when did that kind of kick in so you, you, what year are we talking about so from 2007 to when they were taking 60,000 tons to what year when they were now to, is that now is that is that what we're 2010 2011 so i mean we, we, we can we can talk about the you know where we are now on, on, on quotas and the recovery but certainly the, initially that reduction you know was uh, was in 2011 when uh, the quotas were really first uh, reduced dramatically right. um, but the point we say in 2010, we, you know, we didn't know if these measures were going to really be effective. We didn't know if the stock was going to continue to decline or just level off at a low level. And so the, um, the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, um, it, they, they managed a red list that I think many people will be familiar with. Mm. In 2010, they carried out an assessment using all the ICAT statistics and concluded that um, Atlantic bluefin tuna were globally were endangered, an endangered species. That was published in February 2011. Mm -hmm. And that was spot on. I mean, at the time, we just didn't know what was going to going to happen. The really good news is that program did begin, that recovery program did begin to bear fruit pretty quickly. So within three to four years, there was evidence coming through that the stock had stabilized and was beginning to recover. So as soon as 2015, and the IUCN carried out an assessment of the, uh, that 90%, the Eastern Atlantic Mediterranean stock, and they found, what they found was that the recovery was substantial. There was question marks over the precise extent of the recovery, but they actually applied a rating that was two notches better than endangered, wow. um, near threatened. And they almost used, uh, you can read this up online on their website, they almost used the least concern rating, but there were some uncertainties about the previous two to three years of data. And that's a common theme in Bluefin, we still know there's a lot of gaps in what we know about them. But it was clear really from 2017 onwards, it was pretty clear that the, you know, that 2011 endangered status was already you know, out of date. Now ICAT are, are mandated, sorry, the IUCN are mandated to review uh, these every, uh, every 10 years, and they will be reviewing the global status of Atlantic bluefin again uh, right, right about now. The um, ICAT carry out their stock assessments every three years. Uh, one is due in this year, in 2020. 
Because of COVID um, and the constraints that's had on their meetings, they've been unable to carry out the fully comprehensive review, which would have been updating and tweaking a lot of their models. Um, but they have just published uh, their findings uh, and lots of caveats again. But what it shows is that the recovery is real. Um, it is substantial, but there are definitely uncertainties about the exact scale of this. I mean, the, the, I guess to, to, give it, to give it some context, the core model that they use, um, the VPA model, and, and they, they revise this every three years, obviously it's not just like set in stone, is yeah. um, that should suggest that stocks trough around about 250 to 270,000 tons. This is the stock spawning biomass, mm. um, you know, in around right about 2010. Um, in 2017, that model suggested that stock levels were back up to about 500,000 tonnes, which was back to the mid-1970s mm. level. Now, at face value, this latest assessment um, indicates uh, an SSB that's in the order of 750,000 tonnes. Now, I don't think anybody really believes that, but the point is there is a recovery. That recovery is acknowledged by organisations like the WWF and Pew uh, Charitable Trust. But obviously, we need great care as far as commercial quotas to ensure that we don't reverse, uh, you know, reverse that. So, and the key thing that comes through is more data is needed. And one great source of this information, really for the last 20 to 30 years, has come from uh, recreational anglers and their involvement in research projects. Okay, so it's clear that numbers are recovering in, in the... Uh, in, in the eastern Atlantic or waters around us uh, and if there are so many fish why can't anglers and anglers are accidentally catching them aren't they and they see them all the time why can't we catch them because what a fabulous sport they must be well they would um, but the, the reality is that okay, so the UK has been has been a member of ICAT um, under the EU umbrella um, for as long as we've been a member of the EU but we did not have a share of the EU quota for Atlantic fleet mm -hmm. fishing. Now, that kind of makes sense because look, we didn't have fish in our waters at that time, and we didn't have the specialist sort of long range offshore fleets of long liners and purseine vessels to operate in the North Atlantic. So there was no need for a quota. And the ICAT rules are very clear. Only members of ICAT with a quota or a year by year derogation for special research projects, we'll mm -hmm. come back to but you've got to have quota to be able to fish for them. And that's commercially or even for recreational catch and release fishing. Because ICAT recognises, as we do, that there is some level of mortality associated with even with catch and release fishing. And that mortality has to be accounted for uh, in the ICAT statistics. So you have to have quota. So to operate a long in the long term, to operate a recreational fishery, even catch and release, you know, we need to acquire quota. I mentioned briefly, you know, there are, there are other ways you can fish for them. It's sort of this year by year, you can get a derogation for a scientific research um, based capture. Um, that, um, those programs, are the Irish coined the phrase char, which is catch and release tagging. Right. Um, ICAT uh, will uh, allow that. Um, the Scandies, uh, Denmark and Sweden, uh, and the Irish have been operating these for several years. The Scottish just got permission to operate one this year. This, this is research and development purposes, isn't it? So they're yeah. catching fish, tagging them, what, you know, measuring them, and then releasing them. That's right. Yeah, and there, and there are various forms of, of, you know, of that. I think I think you, you know, we're going to talk a bit about um, you know, about the different research programs, but these are really sort of large scale recreational angler led, but they are you know, they're regulated, they're authorised vessels. It's a very controlled process. Um, that are putting lots and lots of floy tags, you know, dumb tags in these fish, as opposed to the satellite tagging programs, which are much right. more high cost, high tech, you know, but answer different sorts of questions. So we put a proposal in to DEFRA early in 2020 to try and operate a chart program in the UK. They have come back and established a consultation process with us to look at the possibility of such a program in 2021. And we are working on that with a, a number of uh, different uh, different stakeholders. So so you set up the Bluefin Tuna UK group what two years ago. Uh, what's the purpose and objective of that campaign group? I, I guess it's tied up with what you were just saying 
you know, in relation to floor tagging, I guess, was it, and, that, and those programs? Yes, I mean, it's, 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 there's a bigger prize actually than that that we were looking at. But the, the background is that you know, I um, I was fishing out of um, Falmouth in 2016. I could there's a smell. I thought I know that smell from somewhere. I couldn't work out what it was. And then I started to see the oil slicks, you know, on the surface of the water. And it's like that's fish oil. I mean, the last time I smelled this was like, you know, off of uh, off of the Florida Keys or Mauritius or somewhere. And as we got further out, you start to see these masses of birds, you know, busting, and beneath them, you know, there's there's these huge fish that are busting on the surface. And uh, you know, we got closer, and it was. I mean, we'd, we'd been told that there were bluefin around, but you know, I, I I really never dreamed I would see that kind of image in uh, you know in UK waters. So I thought, okay, maybe it's a one-off. 2017, we got uh, the, these fish reappear again. It's absolutely exactly the same images. Um, so we thought this is something that's quite, you know, quite significant. It may not be a one-off. So I started to do some research. These fish may actually be here for several years yet, and th there's going to be a requirement to manage them. And what a fantastic opportunity. If the numbers are recovering and the fish are here, and dozens of other countries have recreational fisheries for them, it's like, maybe we, we should be doing the same thing. So I looked around, but no one was really, you know, was really focusing on this at the time in the fishing world. So I approached a, a large number of charter skippers. I knew guys in my club that were very experienced, big game fishermen. Um, I went to the uh, Angling Trust and we had a discussion and I sort of pitched the idea that maybe we should be looking at, you know, a sort of a recreational live release um, fishery for them because this looked like it was a you know, world-class fishery on our doorsteps. Very exciting, and, uh, I have to say, very exciting. And I remember getting pictures of people sending me pictures of tuna busting and people ca accidentally catching them around about that time, I think, about 50 years ago. They, they are fantastic fish. And what the Angling Trust really gave me was sort of the, the sense of, like, how, do you, how do you develop a strategy? And that's what the Angling Trust did for me, is they, they put me in the room and enabled me to talk to the people that were influential in whether or not this would happen. And I mean, it really is uh, you know, an absolutely world-class fishery. I mean, this is not hyperbole. I've fished, I've been very lucky to fish a lot of places on the planet. And what we have here in terms of Atlantic bluefin is really, even within bluefin circles, it's quite unique because the sheer numbers of fish that you know, we have, and we're seeing this through sort of sightings and the level of bycatch that's going on, it are substantial. The length of the season, these fish arrive in July and often they're still being seen in November, even, even into, mm. into December. But there's not many places you know, outside of the, the home waters like the Mediterranean where the season is that long. You know, the fish are Goldilocks size. And by that, I mean, they're sort of a 250 to 500 pound fish. So they're big enough that they're the fish of a lifetime for anglers. Some of these fish are within, um, within one, two, three miles of the shore. Um, and they're in areas where you have a great tourism infrastructure already and ports that, you know, that could easily transition to operate, you know, fleets that could op which have run a, a, a recreational live release bluefin tuna fishery. You know, the earliest we could get quota to operate this fishery is, um, is November 2021 to operate the following year. So it's, uh, we're in this for the long haul. It's a marathon rather than a sprint. So, I mean, this is, this is really exciting. It's one of the things that I picked up on very quickly when, when you started talking to the Angling Trust about it, because one, one thing I've always been keen on is, is how angling benefits uh, coastal communities. It, it, what, what do you think this kind of fishery will actually do for the economies of, of places like Falmouth and Penzance and, and other places where, where, you know, Lou or Plymouth even, where, you know, these fish could be caught from? I mean, the impact could, could, could be substantial. So could this make a difference? Well, yes. I mean, and, 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 and the catch and release model actually is the, you know, is the way that you optimise the economic value of this resource whilst you know, retaining the issue around sustainability. So the way to think about it simply is, you say, say you had quota uh, that basically equated to one fish. You know, you've just got X, X hundred pounds of quota and that's one fish. So a commercial fishing operation goes out, catches that fish in Cornwall, brings it back, uh, it puts it into market. Now at the dock side, that fish is going to be worth between two to three thousand pounds. Um, instead, if you take that one fish, so how, how, how do they operate? So you have to have a, a mortality assumption. And lots of studies have been done, which show that if you run these fisheries very effectively, you, have a, you can have achieve a mortality rate, a post-release mortality rate of below 5%. So for every hundred fish you catch, five of them, up to five of them may perish, and you have to account for that. 
So say you've got a 5% mortality rate and you're allowed to have one dead fish. Yep. Yeah? That means you can have 20 hookups. Yep. Yeah? Before you assume you've used your quota. And this is how ICAT look at this process. Now, if you say you catch one fish per day on a charter boat, that 20 hookups is 20 charters. Now, at typical rates that they could charge, you're already talking about 13,000 to 15,000 pounds of revenue wow. from the charter fees alone compared to the two to three thousand pounds for the commercially caught fish. Yeah. Now, obviously, there are downstream. <laughs> You know, additional revenues that come from the processing, the wholesaling, etc., uh, of the commercially caught fish. But a lot of those go outside of these areas. Yeah, yeah. The it's like will... there, it doesn't get that money, does it? No, I mean, exactly. You know. Because you get the apart from the charter revenues that are going into these communities, you have the tourism dividend. It's going to be attracting people from all over the globe. Typically, you could expect around fifty percent more again on top of those wow. uh, charter revenues. One tuna ends up being worth more like £20,000. But in Canada, as a real working example of this, Canada has a, around a 500 ton quota from ICAT for Atlantic Bluefin. Um, around 10 years ago, they took 50 tons of that and set it aside for the mortality quota for a purely uh, live release recreational bluefin fishery. Per ton, a recreationally caught bluefin in Canada is worth over six times, I mean six and eight times what the per ton value is of the commercially harvested fish. Another example to give you some sense of the scale of this, in 1994 there were some changes in the in the Gulf Stream and literally in the space of one year a, uh, a winter bluefin tuna fishery appeared off of the coast of North Carolina uh, off of Hatteras on the Outer Banks and uh, Fishermen, the, the, the US fisheries authorities responded really quickly, reallocated quota so that these guys could get out there and fish for bluefin recreationally. Yep. Three years later, a, a consortium of universities came in and did an economic study on that fishery. Yep. Right. Three years after the fish had appeared and the fishery had been set up, that was generating $5 million per year of revenue for the town of Hatteras and three, uh, it's a three marinas that worked on it and obviously some trickle down yeah. in the state and so on so the potential economic value of these fisheries is substantial in the uk this kind of fishery would spread those benefits through all of these communities we know it's a model that works fantastic but i mean how in the end do we go about establishing this fishery in the uk so first of all we have to become a member of icat secondly the case has to be made to uh, the uk government this is something they should be doing and investing in in the short term but we need the support of you know of anglers skippers businesses in these communities then the government if they buy the argument has to go and request quota and win the arguments with icat and that that meeting the first chance for us to do that is november 2021 once all those are done then you've got to put in place you know your your fishery so we've got these various steps and what you're saying is that we we're we're sort of one and a half steps along that road and then i think i mean i think angler support once that case is clear will come won't it and and then we've got to request the quota and then create this fishery so we're kind of you know, a little bit away down that road. But it, it seems to me like we've got a bit, we, we've got work to do, haven't we, in terms of making yeah. it To go to ICAT, we have to have an understanding of these fish in our waters, sort of, you know, how many of them are there? Where, you know, where are they? Um, what's the origin of their stock? You know, and, and you have to have research programs, you know, to help provide that evidence. So the government set up the Tunnish UK project in 2018, which is a um, sort of a, quite a narrow, satellite tagging based program it's sort of it's high tech but because of the costs and so on you can't tag many fish um and that's already answering a lot of questions you know about the fish in our waters but um you know what, what the irish and the swedes and the danes have done and we're arguing we should do the same here alongside that you need to run these larger scale um you know floyd tagging programs that yeah. really use recreational anglers they answer different questions to the questions of the satellite tag you know, can answer but if we can get that program for 2021 that will help our understanding it also could act as a sort of a test bed for a fully fledged larger scale fishery uh, that would come from 2022 if we obtained uh, if we obtained quota fantastic now i know that a lot of um anglers go shark fishing in the west country from Lou. i've done it many times myself Lou and penzance and falmouth and 
but the basic method of, of shark fishing is probably going to mean that occasionally they're going to, anglers are going to hook up accidentally a bluefin tuna. If you're an angler and you hook one by accident, what do you do? Yeah, well, actually, just, if you're just step back on that. So, what we should make clear is what the you know what the legal position is. Yeah, yeah. As the you know the MMO's um, you know interpretation and statements on the legal position. So, we have no quota. Recreational sea anglers in the UK are not permitted um, to target um, Atlantic bluefin even for catch and release. But one way or another, fish are being caught. The skippers are telling me that. You can't, you can't have a bait in the water for a blue shark without a bluefin coming along and snagging it first. So what we've been saying for several years is to these skippers is, look, if you're in these areas and the risk that you're going to catch bluefin is substantial, there's two things you could do. One is move, but these guys have livelihoods to make. Yeah, they've got charters. So you can't just keep moving your boat every time a tuna turns up. It's just economically going to destroy these guys' businesses. You know? um, and secondly... Think about the gear that you use. So it might take some of the, you know, the sporting aspect away of your shark fishing, but really, you know, you need to be thinking about, I mean, an absolute minimum, you should be talking about 50 pound class, you know, tackle. Um, you know, we recommend, you know, 50, 80 rods and 50 wides as, a, as, a, as the floor, really. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have a significant problem, you know, then really, if you were to be targeting them under a fishery, we'd be saying, you know, really, you'd probably be looking at 80 pound, you know, a tackle, given that, you know, most boats in the UK haven't got fighting chairs, it's a, you know, stand up. So um, there are a couple of things you can do to start with. But if you, um, you know, if you do hook one of these fish, I mean, the, you know, you want to try and get it to the boat as soon as possible. Um, we've actually, we've written a piece on this, I think, that uh, your magazine has, has yep. published and yep. we'll put on our website again soon. It's like, you know, here's a, here's a quick and dirty, you know, uh, you know, guide to how you get a blue pin to the boat reasonably quickly. The key thing is um, the recovery, because you know we, have, we can have these very low mortality rates for blue pin. They are incredibly robust fish, but during the process of uh, of extended fights, which will happen particularly with um, bycatch with undergunned tackle, um, they suffer oxygen depletion, and there are various chemical changes, physiological changes that occur that to uh, put them on a path, a process, which can create sort of long-term muscle damage, including heart failure. So, you know, a, a, it is true that if you fight a bluefin for a long time, you know, the, there are risks associated with it, but the really good news is that there are quite simple ways to uh, address that. And that's why we have these sort of sub 5% mortality rates in recreational fisheries. And that's that you need to recover and re-oxygenate the fish. If you re-oxygenate the fish properly, it's, it, it short circuits these processes, it brings them back into great condition and they can swim off and say so you have between sort of one and you know five percent mortality rates which um, we should be we should be aiming for. So the key in the, one is you mustn't board the fish. If you bring one to the side of the boat don't bring it on board. They are robust. Uh, secondly get your recovery protocol sorted and that's basically you want to swim this fish at the side of the boat, preferably if you can swim it on the hook rather than putting chin gaffs in that carry wrists and so on, swim the fish at the side of the boat between five and, and eight knots, depending upon the sea state, the tide run, etc. And you can be swimming that fish for a minimum of sort of five or six minutes. But what you're really looking for is a series of processes. The first thing that happens is the pectoral fins will start to, to flutter. And the second thing is you start to get some very strong tail beats. Now, when you see that, your temptation is going to be to say, this fish is fine, it's 100%, we can let it go. But really what you should do at that point is give it another few minutes because the real measure of a bluefin being ready for release is rather than laying on its side, it will begin to try to bring itself upright. And at that stage, you know, you know that fish is in good condition and you can be very confident that it will, um, it will swim off very, very happily. But that process might take you 10 minutes, it might take you 20 to 30 minutes. But we owe it to these fish and ensure that we send fish away in, you know, in very good shape. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important that we're responsible about this. I mean, um, yeah, we, we use, uh, you know, when we fish overseas and we've, we've done some work for the, uh, the Tanis UK programme, Catching Fish, you know, we have uh, safety lines on the rules um, to, the, to, the, to the vessel. We have a safety guy behind the, the anger at all times um, in case the line goes. We have a whole series of protocols to ensure this is safe and the leader in process 
you know, uh, can be quite hairy. I mean, these are, these are big, these are 500 pound fish, some of them, that you're trying to lead at the side of the vessel. You know, you need to know what you're doing. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a terrible shame that we didn't get, you know, the 2020 chart program, because I think then you know, we could start to put a, you know, a framework in place, including sort of education and support for anglers to really help them, you know, make the best of the situation that can be, you know, can, can go wrong. Uh, for, for all parties involved so um okay yeah. so uh in summary steve how how would you sort of frame what we've been talking about well, i'll say look there's there's an incredible opportunity here the, the, the numbers are recovering the fish are here we have a world-class fishery on our doorstep the uk could really lead the way in establishing a model that sort of optimizes the economic value of these fish um, extracts a lot of scientific value from sort of parallel, you know, research programs and, uh, you know, it helps ensure sort of the long-term sustainability of the, you know, the species. We have a chance in the UK to show that, you know, there is a, there is a, a better model, um, a model which benefits more people, generates more revenue and is sustainable for the, you know, for the fish. So, you, and you can find out a lot more about this on our website, uh, www.bluefintuna.com dot co dot uk okay. the angling trust website carries quite a lot of material on it uh you've got contact details on the website people can get in touch with me and look blue, blue finna bat here you know we we need to ensure they have a you know a future in uk waters and that's not going to happen without the support of you know of anglers and skippers and businesses in these communities well i certainly think it's a, a, a fantastic campaign to get behind and so on and we've got a facebook page um we can tune the UK. Uh, we post a bunch of stuff on that. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks, Steve. I look forward to all that happening. And obviously, we'll keep updating uh, our readers and also on the Angling Trust website with the progress of this particular campaign. And, um, and look out for that. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, too. Cheers.